Good morning. Welcome to the service of worship hosted here at the First Presbyterian Church of New Haven, Connecticut. It is good to gather as the people of God to worship God, even if our gathering is of our hearts and our spirits, while our bodies are apart. A couple of announcements that I want to share with you before we join our voices together in the call to worship. First, as Christians, I've said this before and will probably say it every week, we are called to love God and to love our neighbor. Therefore, it remains crucial that we continue to abide by the practices of social distancing. For the foreseeable future, we will continue to worship together through this format, through online recorded video. All of our music is pre-recorded, and as you'll see this morning, our sermon will be offered by Elder Sarah Harris Wallman, a longtime member of our congregation who recorded her sermon from her home earlier this week. And although we cannot be worshiping together in the same location, you can participate in this service from wherever you are. Just be sure to follow along. There will be text that will appear at the bottom of your screen, text for you to pray and say and sing as you are able. Another way that you can participate in this service is to send me your prayer requests. As you know, we have a prayer wall here in the sanctuary, and every Sunday I add your prayers, our prayers, the prayers of our community to it during the worship service. That's another way that we can pray together and worship together and participate in this service together. And for those of you whose email boxes are inundated with materials of all kinds, from organizations and businesses and groups and schools and clubs, a weekly email from the church can get lost in the mix. However, I want to draw your attention to it because our weekly email is chock full of lots of ways that you can participate and be involved in the ministry of Jesus Christ in the world today. And whether you are new to our community or have been a part of us for a long time, you are welcome to participate in any way that you feel called. If you don't already receive the email but would like to, in order to stay connected to us, please do reach out to us at the office, office at fpcnh.org, and we will be sure to keep you in touch with us as a community. We'll keep you up to date on all that's happening in our church-wide communications and activities. And one final note that I want to offer before we get started, before we get comfortable and prepared for worship is this week we endured the tropical storm Isaias, and it really wreaked havoc upon Connecticut. And I want to offer our prayers for all of our community members who have been affected by this storm. Here at the church, we were very fortunate. We had just a few limbs down and nothing too destructive. But I do know that many of our members of the community they're with it without power or were without power for an extended period of time. And some of us still need help clearing out our yards. If you're one of these people, please do reach out to me or to the office and let me know. There are many members of our congregation who have ready hands uh, and are happy to help. So please do, um, do what you can to reach out, call for help, and also to offer a hand of support to those who need it as we recover from this storm. Now. I want to invite you to get comfortable, to have a cup of tea or coffee or uh, whatever it might be that will make you feel more comfortable. Uh, grab some flowers or light a candle. Create a worshipful space around you. And I invite you to join your heart with mine as we together join our voices in the call to worship. It had been a long day. The heat, the crowds, the grumblings of life, he sensed something new, something special, something holy with this man. A breath, a wind swirled and blew. They met as the noise of the day faded. A patient breath taught a perceiving heart. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Come, let us worship God.
so it is with everyone who, who is born of the Spirit. In just a few minutes, we will hear this puzzling phrase again out of the mouth of Jesus, and as we prepare to hear it, let us first consider our approach, our posture. Rather than approach the text with a posture of rationalizing what it might mean in the context of our lived experience, let us first be honest about our lived experience and then assume a posture of openness, of vulnerability, to allow these words of Jesus to seep into our lives, seep into our spirits. First we will pray in silence and then we will join our voices together in the prayer of confession as printed on your screen. Let us pray. And together we pray, Holy God, we confess that we do not fully trust you. We put our hope in worldly gain and in human promises and find ourselves defeated and lost when things fall apart. We build paper mountains and we rail at you when they burn. You have given us a love more fully than anything we could experience in this world, but we do not seek it. We do not hold on to it. And we look to our own means of assurance and security. Forgive us, O oh God. Help us to hear the wind, not knowing where it comes from, and be satisfied that you are our gracious hope and our loving joy. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Church, you are God's beloved. With you, God is well pleased. You are renewed and restored. You are forgiven and loved. You are a new creation in Christ. Everything old has passed away. See, everything is becoming new. So friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. You alone, O God, are holy. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. Hallelujah. Come and fill our hearts with your Where do we begin, we ask, O oh God? Every time we approach your word, it is as if we are learning to open ourselves to your loving presence anew. Be with us yet again. Startle us yet again with your love and your grace, with your truth and with your compassion, O oh God. Through your word, start. first scripture reading for this morning comes to us from Psalm 139, verses 7 through 14. Let us pray together these words of the psalmist. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. 
the psalmist goes on to tell us, For it was you, O God, who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. Amen. Hi, I'm Sarah Wallman. Thank you so much for uh, giving me the opportunity to do this. Our second reading for today comes from John chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Let us listen for the word of God. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and of the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised by my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When I was a kid, I used to try to convince my mom that any song that mentioned prayer was inherently religious. So Bon Jovi's Living on a Prayer, Madonna's Like a Prayer, you may remember MC Hammer, we need to pray just to make it today. Um, but I was being a little bit disingenuous because I was not really interested in the spiritual implications of these songs. I just liked the way that they felt when I sang them or danced to them. I wanted earthly things to be heavenly things. The song that informs my homily today is Walk by the Foo Fighters. Uh, it came out in 2011, so I was already well past the point of needing to justify my musical choices uh, to my parents, but the habit still hasn't totally died. So um, I'm, I'm gonna point out that prayer is mentioned in this song. Um, I, and I do, you really should listen to the song if you haven't yet. Uh, the hallmark of any great Dave Grohl song is that it starts off kind of moody and melodic and then builds to uh, kind of a primal scream, um, which is great for, you know, thrashing your head around too. Uh, and Walk is no exception. The, the chorus uh, repeatedly comes back to the line, uh, learning to walk again. Um, and uh, at the climax of this song, the vocals plead, I'm on my knees, I'm praying for a sign, forever, whenever, I never want to die. And you do have to listen to the whole song to appreciate the drama of, of that plea. Um, I'm dancing on my grave, I'm running through the fire, forever, whenever, I never want to die. It's this existential cry from, from deep in the gut. I felt uh, I've I felt that I've never want to die um, at moments when my car skids on an ice patch or, uh, or more, more recently in the grocery store when somebody coughed a little bit too close to the back of my neck. I never want to die. I never want to die. The time that I listen to this song the most is, uh, is, is when I'm running on the treadmill. Um, at the most intense part of my workout, when my artificial trek is at its, its most arduous incline uh, and its fastest acceleration, uh, when my blood is pumping and my lungs are grabbing the air, 
and and it it feels it, it makes the I don't really like working out and it makes the workout actually feel kind of invigorating um, I'm a little bit reluctant to talk about working out in a church setting because it does seem a bit vain um, you know I should say that I think about burning calories um, for health reasons but but a lot of it really is vanity um, the love of, of um, clothes um, and fitting into clothes um, and I I wish that I were I wish I were above that there's a, a Kurt Vonnegut story that I teach sometimes in my classes called Unready to Wear. Um, and in this story, human beings have learned how to extract their essence from their bodies. They, um, they, they live as kind of pure essence in the air and they, they keep bodies in, the, they only save the good looking bodies or the athletic bodies and they keep them in a warehouse and if they ever want to experience the physical realm they can go sort of float into a body and and, and wear it like a costume for a day but but mostly they don't um and and the bad guys in the story are the people who insist that human beings should stay in their bodies and uh, that they have sort of a duty to to have a physical body um the main character uh, has given up his porta potty business it's it's gone out of business because um nobody eats and nobody uses porta potties so the kind of classic mind body problem that you might remember from philosophy 101 is just it's just solved in the story you know nobody has physical needs the gospel passage that i've chosen for today from the book of john is um in a way, I guess, about the this, this spirit body problem. Uh, in this passage, Nicodemus comes to, to see Jesus in the night so that nobody will, will see him uh, being present with Jesus. Um, and Jesus tells him that he must be born again. So from our position as full-out Christians who worship in the light of day, we chuckle at his boneheaded literal-mindedness. You know, I can't crawl into my mother's womb. Silly Nicodemus, it's a metaphor. Jesus means you must forge a new, a, self, a new self, shed your old ways. Metaphor, duh. But here's what I wanna to ask today. What if this text, like so much of the Gospel of John, is, is double-edged? What, what if it cuts both ways? What if Jesus wants to turn some part of us away from our preoccupation with the physical world and some part of us toward it? What if the point is not simply to replace the physical with the spiritual, but to establish a link between the two? It helps me to consider the story um, in light of the one that comes right after it. Um, the next chapter, John chapter four, tells the story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman. Um, that's, this chapter also offers a, a physical representation of a spiritual truth. Uh, and in this case, this, the, the, spiritual, the, the physical representation of the spiritual truth is thirst. Jesus asks for an actual, water, an actual drink of water, and in turn, he offers the Samaritan woman living water. Unlike Nicodemus, her initial response is enthusiastic. Give me the water, you're a prophet, etc. Also, unlike Nicodemus, she brings her friends to meet Jesus in the public square. Of the two converts, Nicodemus would seem the more suited for spiritual enlightenment. And I, I don't mean that temperamentally, but physically. He's materially comfortable. He's, he's the right race and gender. His job is studying God. The needs of his body do not intrude on his contemplative life. Nicodemus gets thirsty, sure, but he has someone to get his water for him. This is not the case with the Samaritan woman. She doesn't even get a name because her, her physical circumstances suffice to define her. Woman, Samaritan, not wife, water getter. But Jesus finds both of these people worthy of receiving his most powerful metaphors, being born again and drinking living water. 
But man can't live by metaphor alone. The preposterousness of this idea of rebirth returns Nicodemus to an awareness of the space he occupies, the limitations of his body, the impossible irony that it is through these limitations, it is through our limitations that we will transcend. Transcending your physical limitations may be a familiar concept to you if you meditate. The first step is not just to kind of magically float out of your body, like in the Kurt Vonnegut story, but to, to pay special attention to your breathing. Um, or I've recently learned that sometimes people who are processing trauma struggle to meditate in this way um, that, that, that focusing on breath can, can bring up, uh, can, can bring up traumatic memories. Um, and for them, the suggested alternative is to focus instead on their hands and feet uh, to get into that meditative space. So back to Nicodemus, interesting aside, um, when Jesus dies, Nicodemus is one of the ones who tends to his body. He pays for expensive herbs so that Jesus will have uh, the proper traditional funeral rites. Uh, and that chapter doesn't offer a lot of interpretive gloss. Um, it's pretty straightforward and narrative. Um, so we're, we're left to wonder whether, whether is this Nicodemus still not getting it? Nicodemus caught up in the empty physical ritual when the truth of the resurrection is about to break open the world? Or is this gesture of Nicodemus's meant to give a final emphasis to Jesus's physicality. God had a body and Nicodemus got it after all. In lockdown, I've paid a lot of attention to my body. I don't just mean self-care like running or ice cream or uh, using fancy lotion, but, but paying attention to what my body means to others as a vector of illness as an intervention to loneliness, as an embodiment of the status quo, as one tiny cell in a massive body of protest. We've all had to think more carefully about physical presence and, and, and make these big decisions about where our bodies belong. And I, I hope this new attention brings us to realizations we may have previously ignored when we seek to transcend the physical world, when we're so sure that we're getting what Nicodemus missed, we may blind ourselves to the work we need to do here. We may say, I don't see color, or squirm at uncomfortable conversations about inequities. We may hold a building, sorry, we may, we may hold a meeting in a building without a ramp. We may speak only our own language. We may forget that hunger is not just a metaphor. I miss so much being in a sanctuary full of living, breathing, singing people. I miss the feel of bread on my tongue. I miss sitting near a good alto who can kind of steer me to the harmony. I miss the awkwardness when the offering plate goes the wrong way um, or when a baby's cry breaks the sacred silence and we take it as a kind of amen. A couple of years ago, we did this prayer. This is, this is BJC. Uh, uh, we did this prayer that required us to get out of our seats and form a circle around the sanctuary. Um, do you remember this? Uh, we stood instead of sitting. We held each other's hands instead of pressing our own together. Um, and, uh, and, and just sort of form this big circle. And it was very meaningful. And I hope that it does not undercut the description to also tell you that at the most quiet moment of this communal prayer, the person next to me farted really loudly. And um, I, had to, I, I had to hold my breath to keep from laughing, but it didn't ruin it. Um, our bodies are, are often hindrances to our true selves. You know, they're so often hindrances to who we want to show ourselves and who, what we want to share with others. They announce us before we have a chance to speak. They throw up barriers that shouldn't be. 
and someday we will be free of them. But today, this passage makes me think that the mind-body problem, the spirit-body problem, isn't something that can be solved uh, while the body still exists. Um, we may be free of our bodies someday, but it's, it's not today. For now, these bodies are the vehicle that we've been given for this life, and we should learn how to walk in them again and again. Let's take a moment of silence. As a community of faith, we are offered the gift of prayer, taking time to connect with one another and with God. We pray together for ourselves, for our community, and for the world. Therefore, please join your heart with mine and let us pray. God of Abram and Nicodemus, God of all of us who think we are too old or too poor or too small or too weak or too busy, God of all of us daunted by the sheer wonder of the plan you lay out before us, we come to you now, aware of all you have done for us, and yet struggling with our doubts. Birth us all anew, O God. Hear us and help us on our journey. God of Abram and Nicodemus, we pray for this world where so many wander homeless, not by choice, but out of necessity, where so many are looking for milk and honey or a great name to rescue them. We pray for all the people in this world, especially prayers for all our teachers, aides, staff, school administrators, and parents of school children making decisions about returning to school. Grant them wisdom and peace. Bestow upon them a sense of graciousness toward one another as they face difficult decisions, as well as a sense of flexibility, hope, and an understanding of care for the whole community. Prayers for Jim and Liz Owens and the whole Owens family as they continue to mourn the loss of James IV, who passed away this past December. Bring a sense of your healing balm upon them. Help them know that they are not alone, but are surrounded by a cloud of loving witnesses to their sorrow and their joy. And additionally, for the Owens nephew who passed away this week, we lift up this family as they mourn so much untimely death. We ask prayers for Gloria as she looks for work and meaningful housing. We ask prayers for civil servants in our country who seek to serve the public interests and protect everyone's right to vote. Prayers of thanks for the newest member of our church family, Clara. God of Abram and Nicodemus, we pray for all those who long for a new beginning, those who are imprisoned, those who are estranged, those who have left loved ones behind. Give them all new life by the power of your spirit. Help us to see how we can be present with them as your hands and feet. Birth us all anew, O God. Hear us and help us on our journey. God of Abram and Nicodemus, we pray for your holy church. Give us the courage to leave everything behind and follow you. Give us the faith to act on what we do not understand. Bless us to be a blessing to everyone in your name. Birth us all anew, O God. Hear us and help us on, your, on our journey. Birth us all anew, O God. Hear us and help us on our journey. Help us to grow up again to accept not only earthly things, but heavenly things, to lift up your son and be lifted up ourselves, to let your spirit move us beyond understanding. This we pray, along with the prayers of our hearts, in the name of the one who taught us to pray in languages and traditions familiar to our hearts, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. 
Amen. These days, dear church, in these COVID times, when we've been quarantining, when we've been missing our friends, our families, when we miss worshiping together in person, when we're stressed about what will happen next, will schools start in person for children? Will the universities come back to in-person instruction? Will everything be online? We're prone to become overwhelmed, even paralyzed. And this sensation of paralysis, well, it often prevents our sense of creativity, our sense of generosity. But our faith reveals a truth that our God is a creating and generous God. And our God is with us in all of these experiences and moments, from the moments of great stress to the moments of great joy. And in all things, God bestows great abundant blessings upon us. Blessings of grace, blessings of love, blessings of compassion. No matter where we are in life, we are drawing upon an abundant well of goodness from which we are called to share and to give out of. No matter the size of our gift, our offering is an act of worship. It is our proclamation that God is indeed present with us and is at work among us, ushering us and the whole world towards peace, towards justice, towards wholeness, the act of giving is an act of our participation, an expression of our commitment that we as individuals and we as a community are a part of the redeeming and resurrecting ministry of Jesus Christ that is active and alive in the world today. And as recipients of God's unending grace and love, we do have something to offer out of this wealth of goodness, something to give that's meaningful for the transformation of the world. To give, you can visit the church website or simply click the My Gift to Give link that you've, where you found this worship link. Or you can text the number that will appear at the bottom of your screen. However you give, please, please give generously to the ministry and mission of Jesus Christ at work in the world. Through our giving, we boldly declare that God is a God of presence, a God of peace, a God of love, and our God is still creating and still present in our midst throughout all of our lives. Our morning offering will now be received. generous hearts. Help us to build a community where there are no enemies, only siblings and neighbors. Help us build a community where there is compassion and kindness, that it moves through the air we breathe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, as we go from this time of worship, I invite you to go secure in the knowledge that God is with you, tending to you, caring for you, creating sacred moments in all that you do. So go.
But the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit this day and forevermore. Hallelujah. Amen.